Today is 30th of April, 2024. My name is and this is the interview for the memory, Case of Memory project. Um, Andrew, could I begin by asking you to confirm your name, please? Sure. Andrew Wong, Chef Patron of Restaurant A Wong in London. Okay. Uh, can you spell it for me? Just Andrew please. Wong, yeah. A-N-D-R-E-W space W-O-N-G. <laughs> okay, Andrew. And can you name your Chinese name? Sure, it's Wong Zhan Kao. Okay, okay, thank you. So, um, firstly, I would like to thank you for accepting our uh, interview request. So, we would like to begin to actually exploring some of your personal background. Can you briefly tell us about your upbringing, for example, like uh, where you born, your education level, and your current family situation? Sure, I, I, I was born in 1982. Um, my grandfather had a restaurant in the Midlands and then had a restaurant in Chinatown in Gerrard Street and then my parents opened a restaurant in Victoria which is the same site that we sit on today in 1985 and then my father passed away in 2004 and my wife and I took over the site that we're sitting on now in 2011 and it's now 2024 so we've been running a restaurant now for 11 straight 12 years. Okay, thank you. So um, you mentioned because uh, you take over the family business uh, when your father passed away. Okay, can you explain a little bit? So how come you decide to take over the business? Because I understand that actually your university, your study is another chocolate. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So I was, I was, um, I grew up in a restaurant, and I never really wanted to work in a restaurant. Um, but when my, f I was studying chemistry at Oxford, and then I studied social anthropology at the LSE. And while I was studying in London, my th father passed away. So I only ever really got into the restaurant business to temporarily help my mother out, and then one thing led to another. I went to catering school to learn um, some basics um, and then I became interested in cooking and then I found some friends and contacts who told me to go and study in Sichuan, in the Culinary Institute, Sichuanese Institute and then I worked in some hotels in Qingdao and Beijing uh, and Hong Kong before I came back to London and then we opened the restaurant in 2011. Yeah, but can you tell us actually why your family decided to run a catering business? Are they the first generation of the migrant? My grandfather was the first generation migrant. Well, it depends. If you say the first generation migrants is 18 something, then no. But my grandfather came to London or England in the late 60s. So that's when restaurants really started to open a lot more, even though the first ever Chinese restaurant is still 1800, 1908, um, but this is a lot further on, uh, when after Chinatown was in Soho. Okay. So your father, your grandfather come from Hong Kong? Uh, yes. Okay, so the whole family uh, background is from Hong Kong? Kind of. My grandfather was in the army, um, and then there were refugees in from China into Diamond Hill and then from Diamond Hill um, slowly they either, some of the family went to America and some of the family came to the UK. When you mentioned in the army, is in the uh, which part of army? Which army or? Oh the uh, Chinese, Chinese, Chinese army. army. Yeah, not, uh, not the Communist Party <laughs> army basically. <laughs> um, and, and so yeah, so my, my auntie came first and then afterwards, uh, my father and my grandfather came. My father came initially to study. Uh, he was not so good at studying, um, from what I've been told. And so he wanted to go into kind of hospitality. So he used to have like a, a street stall that he had in the Midlands, selling like hamburgers and stuff, where he used to steal the electricity from the hospital um, to power the street stall. And that's where he met my mother, who was a nurse at the hospital. And then from that, 
they came down to London because my grandfather decided to uh, move from the restaurant that he had in the Midlands into Chinatown uh, where he had um, a joint business with three or four other people in Chinatown uh, and my father got into hospitality then then went to Germany um, to explore other opportunities at the time it was very very big they were looking for Chinese speaking individuals to go to places um, like Germany to basically help with a lot of the Hamburg in order for a lot of the trade. Mm -hmm. So they wanted bilingual people to help with the trading. Um, so he went there initially to do that, ended up opening a hotel or running a hotel uh, there, ended up trying to buy it. And then after that came back to London, had a series of pubs in the East End. Uh, so we, within the family, we had two or three pubs in the East End. My father was, I think the first ev ever Chinese publican in the UK and then from that he decided that he wanted to um, leave running a pub because it's very dangerous having a pub in the east end of London in the 70s and then decided to go into the restaurant business um, and he didn't want to run one in Chinatown because my grandfather had a restaurant there so he decided to open this restaurant in Victoria. Okay, uh, so what was the restaurant in Chinatown worked by your grandfather? It's called Lok Hau Fok. Lok Hau Fok. Yeah. Okay. So it was, it's, if you look at it now, it's on Gerard Street. As you walk in under the arches, uh, I think it's uh, the bubble tea shop. And then the two units after that, that used to be one restaurant. And that was my grandfather's restaurant. Okay. What cuisine is... So, so that, that restaurant, along with, along with Poon's... Um, it was one of the first restaurants to serve dim sum, so it's very Cantonese. Okay, thank you. So, um, how long was the Lok Hau Fok last for? Lok Hau Fok last, lasted until... Um, let me think. Uh, I imagine early 90s, they had a fire. I had a fire in a restaurant, and then my grandfather decided to sell. I, I, I think it's a, the, I was around 12, I think, so that would have been around 1994, I, I'm guessing. Okay. Do you have any memory uh, associated with this restaurant? Sure, yeah, yeah, absolutely, Chinatown. This restaurant was so busy, I remember, because they were the first, one of the first two or three restaurants that served dim sum. They used to have queues going out of the restaurant from morning until night time. Um, my dad very rarely helped there actually because he had this site here. My auntie used to help there um, and it was it was crazy. And so, so on Sundays we used to go there while my grandfather was working, we'd have our family meals there. We used to always hide underneath the tables while the parents were eating. Um, and if we weren't there, we were across the road at Mr. Lee's restaurant, which is, at the time it was Harbour City. Obviously, now he owns New Longform. Uh, but Harbour City would either go there for dim sum or look how Um And yeah, it was, it was a big part of, um, of my childhood growing up in London. What sort of the dim sum at that time, you know, Chinatown Chef? I think the, the dim sum they were serving then was very similar to the dim sum that you see now in, um, in a lot of parts of the UK and, and actually in Hong Kong. Ha Gao, Siu Mai, Siu Long Bao, Fong Jiao. Dong Fong Law, um, you know, San Jin Bao, Cha Siu Bao, it was, it was this, the staple uh, selection of dim sum that you see in a lot of restaurants even today, very traditional. So what was your favourite dim sum during your childhood at that time? Oh, good question. Good question. Probably like a Cha Siu Bao, I imagine. Because I remember Shanghai dumplings, they, they, back in the 80s, they were very thick. Um, they weren't as refined as now you look at Ding Tai Fong or you look at what we do in the restaurant. We try to make the skin really, really thin. In the early 80s and late 70s, um, it was very thick, um, probably because they couldn't get hold of the right flour or the technique wasn't quite right. Um, but the Cha Siu Bao were always very, very special, I think. So was your grandfather a Ding Tai Fong No, no, no. My grandfather, don't think, I don't think he really knew how to cook very well. But um, he was very good because uh, he had a lot of contacts still in China. 
um, and still in Taiwan. Um, and so he was able to get a lot of ingredients into London that previously were not available in London. Um, so there were three or four of him and his friends from the military who came together to open this restaurant and they used a lot of their contacts in order to bring a lot of the ingredients to London. So did he won the restaurant by the ministry? <laughs> he probably tried to. <laughs> probably, I mean, it was a very, very successful restaurant. Um, so busy, I remember. Um, and, you know, ultimately his background was not in running a restaurant. Right? He was previously in the military. Um, he, he had a bit of experience from helping his friend in the Midlands before he took that restaurant over. So it was, it was basically a skill that he learned later on in life. Um, so, yeah, with, with most things in hospitality, you just learn from your mistakes. Okay. So, um, what made him to run the restaurant? Can you remember? Or did your family tell you? So, he got into the restaurant industry only because the contact that he had before coming to the UK was already running a restaurant. And actually, in that time, there was not that many options besides going into hospitality. Okay. It was very standard. If you go into the Midlands, where they were, they were in a place called Nuneaton. It's a very, very small town. Um, uh, there, you know, there, there weren't that many opportunities to, to um, enterprise uh, besides going into hospitality, having a takeaway, or having a restaurant, or having some kind of food-related business. So after the fire, did your grandfather want any other business? In London? No, no, he retired. Yeah, he was old by then, he, by, the, by the 90s, by the late 90s, he was already in his 70s. When I talk about your father, you mentioned about uh, he went to pub and then he went to a restaurant in Chinatown as well, uh, in uh, Victoria. Yes. Okay, yeah. can you share more information, you know, the story? Sure, so I mean, he, he had, um, him and my auntie both had pubs, um, and they were in the east end of London. So they're very, very, very rough, rough parts of London in the in the late seventies, eighties. Limehouse. No, not that quite that. Bermondsey. 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 So you know the stories we used to remember is um, growing up were like you know people would go into the pub, they would start an argument. My father was the landlord of the pub, so he would kick them out, and then you in the middle of the night. You look out the window, and his car had been set on fire, um, and it was like it was it was normal back then, you know. Or there would be big fights in the pub, and so um, you know it'd be mayhem, um, a lot of commotion, um, and and then throughout that time, you know, we were still very very young, so all we remember is living above the pub at the time, um, and you know it was it was a it was an interesting time, um, a lot of action. Back then, there were a lot of kind of um, a lot of young. I remember a lot of young uh, guests of the pub who ended up going on to do amazing things. I remember Boy George was was a member of the pub. The Die Straits used to play at the pub, and they used to play before they became famous. Um, what's his name? Uh, the famous pianist who has his own show now, uh, where he was young. Growing up as a teenager, he would perform at the pub um, and pick up tips. Um, and my parents, my, my father would would encourage them to come in and perform, and my auntie would encourage them to come and perform as entertainment. Um, and yeah, it was it was a, it was a very enterprising time. So tell us about the pub food at the time. Oh, they didn't serve food. It was I remember it was just those those packets of like chips and scampi fries and things on the side. There was no food. Okay. So how this member influence yourself as a chef or maybe say as an immigrant in the UK? Do you consider yourself British Chinese or Chinese? Um, I, I don't know what British Chinese really means there. This is the problem. I think people are very quick to say, oh, I'm, I'm British Chinese. But what does that mean? Does it mean you're British born in Chinese? But Brit you're, you're Chinese but born in Britain or what? So you feel yourself more likely to a British upbringing or a Chinese culture? 
I think I'm neither. I don't feel like I'm I'm more British, and I don't feel like I'm more Chinese. I feel like you're halfway between both. So, you know, I mean, I spent the last 17 years of my life in this career trying to relate my culture to China, to Chinese history, to Chinese gastronomy, and relate it and translate it to to the UK in a way that I feel it will be easily understood. So, does that mean that I'm British? I don't think so.、Um, I, I have. Um, many many friends who I would consider to be more British by heritage,、um, more British in culture. I feel like the way that I was brought up meant that being Chinese was an important thing, and to hold on to those Chinese customs was important. To celebrate Chinese New Year, to celebrate the Mid Autumn Festival, to celebrate、uh, Qingmingjie, to you know do a lot of the. Rituals that we did growing up, and the, the the mentality of work, the mentality of、um, embracing culture, the mentality of having family values. I think that has always been very deeply rooted in kind of my grandparents and my parents' idea of kind of Chinese culture. Okay, so with your childhood memory, how this memory? Influence yourself as a chef. Which Chinese memory? Childhood memory. Which childhood memory? Okay,、uh, you went to your grandfather's restaurant, your、okay. father's pop's restaurant. You know this kind of the family business memory.、Um, I think the most important thing I learned from not only seeing my grandfather, but also my 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 parents in the restaurant here, was this idea that.、Um, Sometimes work isn't as simple as I enjoy something and it's a passion, therefore that's our job. It's yes, we want to enjoy it, and yes, we want to have a passion for what we do, but also、um, it's a job. So we need to do things in order to allow our children, our grandchildren, to have a better life. And if that means that our job has to become our lifestyle. And the sacrifices that have to be made have to be made. Then so be it.、Um, I remember on Christmas Day, every year when we were child,、uh, children growing up, my sister and I, we would normally always spend it at my grand with my grandparents in、um, in Nuneaton, which is about hundred miles away. But every year there would be a Japanese tour group that my dad would accept. That would come in for lunch first. So we'd come in, we'd all help out in the restaurant first. Like a hundred Japanese tourists. We're coming on a tour bus. They come in. They would eat. I don't know. I remember it was like a five-pound meal,、uh, set menu. Then we would clean up. Then we would all go into the car and drive up to my grandfather,、uh, grandparents' house. And that is actually a very, I mean, it's it's a very unique kind of cultural experience to have. Most families wouldn't do that. Most families would be like, oh, when it's Christmas Day, we're just not going to work. We'll go see your grandparents. Go spend time together. But my my parents were very very adamant that. Work is work, and if you want to have X, Y, and Z, then we need to make sacrifices. Therefore, Christmas Day we have to work first before we go to spend time with the grandparents. So, how will you represent yourself as a Chinese chef? Do you think, and how this is related to the restaurant you work with? Sorry, how do I what? Okay.、Um, <laughs> I have admit that it's actually a question made by the researcher is a little bit difficult to understand. Right.、Okay. So I changed the wording. Okay. Sure. Um. How would you like to represent yourself as a Chinese chef in the UK? Okay. How do I represent myself as a Chinese chef in the UK? Right. Um. You know, we we have a very very unique position at the moment. At 2024, we are the only two Michelin star Chinese restaurant in the Western world, and with that comes、um, a lot of responsibility. So、um, people look at what we do, and sometimes they they map it out against、um, how people perceive Chinese food in general. 
But of course, what we do is, I would like to think it's it's unique and it's very different to what a lot of other Chinese restaurants do. Um, so the way I I like to, well, not I don't do it intentionally, but what we try to do in a restaurant all the time is that we try to put our interpretation on Chinese food. And so what does that mean? It means that we we try to use ingredients around us to cook for the people around us um, in an interesting way to celebrate not only Chinese food, but also Chinese culture um, and the the changing climate of Chinese gastronomy back in China and also globally. So you mentioned about is about 2024. So are there any changes start from the beginning to now? Oh, loads of changes. The, the, the restaurant's changed um, massively over the last um, 12 years. It's a completely different restaurant. When we first opened, uh, the the restaurant conceptually was very much just, just really about um, being a really relaxed restaurant that my wife and I would like to go to. That was very simple. That was the only real concept behind the restaurant. And a lot of the dishes were very much my favorite dishes from around China and from Hong Kong and from Taiwan and we basically trying to recreate them and bring them to London. So finding the best Gongchang Ho or finding the best um, Soju Yu or whatever it is and just trying to recreate it. I think as time has gone on and we've developed as a restaurant, we really no longer do that. I mean now at lunchtime we offer dim sum but dim sum isn't really just about making a hagao silmai anymore. It's about celebrating what we think is important about dim sum, historically and culturally. And in the evening, we don't even have a menu anymore. We serve a 30, between 33 and 38 course menu, which is shared. And it's served in a collections, in six collections. Um, and that really is a celebration of, of the idea of of kind of imperial banqueting and the idea of how people used to eat during that time and it's trying to take that and bring it into 2024 in an interesting and unique way. You mentioned about the importance culture of dim sum. Right. Yeah. Can you explore it a little bit? Sure. So people always they think of dim sum, they think, oh, you know, it's it's from Hong Kong or Canton and it originates from uh, the times when People were traveling through the Silk Road and they would stop off at tea houses and they would drink tea and then while they were drinking tea, people would give them these small bites as complimentary uh, bites to pay for the, well, to, to accompany the tea. But actually, I don't like to think of dim sum like that. The way I like to think of dim sum is more kind of mid 1800s when there was a lot of international trade going on in um, Guangzhou. Um, there were a lot of British trade, Middle Eastern trade, trade with India, um, and there were these kind of these middlemen traders in Guangzhou who were basically dealing with the West, the West, and they were basically making these multi-million pound deals. So this was a time in southern China where some of the richest people in the world existed. They were trading silver, silk, gold, jade, everything. And basically, these middlemen who were Chinese, they basically said to chefs from all over China, said, look, we need to look after these multi-millionaire people who come in to trade with us. We need to put Chinese culture at the forefront of international culture. We need to show them how special we are. So they got the best chefs from all over China to come into Guangzhou and basically cook the very best of what they knew. And that really, to me, is the original, um, origins of dim sum. Okay. So what being a Chinese chef mean to you? Chinese chef to me is basically finding our way to express our food heritage and our food culture that I grew up with. You know, If it's Chinese then it's Chinese. If it's got some other kind of influence mixed in then so be it. But ultimately I am Chinese. Uh, my family history is Chinese. I think culturally I'm very Chinese. And so the food that I cook is a reflection of that. Okay. So being a Michelin uh, star to uh, chef, 
about what it means to you and your family? To be a Michelin, to, well, you know, I, I would say Michelin and no Michelin is, um, it, it's not for me to say, you know, we, we, we've been lucky enough to be awarded these things. Um, I think more importantly is the fact that, um, the fact that someone like Michelin has awarded a Chinese restaurant in the Western world to Michelin stars, it says a lot about the changing world more than us. It says that the way people perceive Chinese gastronomy is changing. And we are just a little bit part of that. And I always said that when we won the second star, when I won the first star, it was very much a very personal kind of um, achievement. It was an achievement for myself, my wife, and basically the, the, the team, the starting team that we had from 2011. When we won the second star, it was much more about the community. It was very much about the fact that we were, I, I personally started to look at it in terms of, wow, all these people before, whether it be Mr. Poon, or it be Mr. Lee, or it be Ken Lo, or it be Ken Hom, um, all these people had laid down all these foundations for a restaurant like ours to win two Michelin stars in 2021. So you mentioned about a lot of uh, historic people like Ken Lo, sure. start from the beginning. So are there any influence from him? Because uh, he was the first one to uh, present Chinese food in the BBC at that time. Ken Lo or Ken Hong? Ken Lo. Was he the first? He was the first. Before Ken Hong? Really? Different age. Oh, <laughs> didn't know that. So, where, oh, are you sure? Of course, I did. Where did Ken Lo did go on the BBC? Just before the time. It's uh, just after the um, embassy disband. Which is when? 60s? It was 60s, yeah. Okay, what did he do on the BBC? He said how to cook Chinese food. Really? Yes. Why did we never see it? I think all the archive for you. Okay, okay. all right, <laughs> sure. Tell me. But I tell you, the Ken Lo, I remember, because when, um, when I was first learning to cook, I remember I really wanted to learn how to pull noodles. Um, and there were not many people in London who knew how to pull noodles. But chef, chef Butt. Chef Butt. Butt. Chef Butt. Yes. But Chef Butt was not the one who taught me. One of his told, they taught me. Yeah, Chef Butt worked for Ken Lo. Yes. yes, yes, but one of his told, they was the one who taught me how to do it. But obviously Chef Butt taught him. Um, and so I, I am forever grateful to Ken Lowe for his chef learning how to pour noodles and showing me how to pour noodles. Okay. So how would you consider someone as a Chinese chef? So oh, that's a very hard question. Chef, yeah. How do I, what, sorry? How would you consider someone as a Chinese chef? What criteria do you think? I have no idea. I, I, I really honestly can't answer that. And i tell you why, because the way the world is going at the moment, you know, there are, there is, we live in such an open world of information. Um, this isn't the 80s anymore. We have the internet. We have a very good close network between chefs in sharing knowledge globally. And so we're in a situation now when I look at a lot of um, chefs who, who, are, who don't have a Chinese heritage, but they're fascinated by Chinese cuisine. And people like Fuchsia, for example, you know, who have embraced language, culture, gastronomy. It's no longer about whether or not you come from a Chinese heritage or not. It's, it's how you utilize the knowledge that is around us in what I like to think is as evolving the Chinese repertoire. You know, I look at some really young modern chefs and even their restaurants, they don't classify it as being a Chinese restaurant, but there's more and more Chinese influence in those dishes, whether it be the technique for marination, or it be they've got a small element of how we make seal yolk, or as a small element of how they make chou pei gay, or bucking out. And they're using these very, very traditional Chinese techniques and putting it into their restaurants. And I think actually, when people start realizing that those are very, very ancient Chinese techniques, and actually doesn't mean that they're Chinese chefs, maybe. 
you mentioned about the network between chef or maybe Chinese chef. So, is the an official one or an official one? Official network? Mm-hmm. No, it's all unofficial. We're friends now. You know, Instagram, Facebook. You know, we go and do forehand dinners. We go and eat in each other's restaurants, and afterwards we will go and yin gao. You know, different recipes, different techniques. Whether it would be from the older generation for someone like Mr. Poon, or be the old, slightly younger than Mr. Poon generation, so still working chefs like Chef Tam in Macau, or you know, you could talk about、um, Danny Yip in the chairman. And we go even younger than that. You know, you've got many chefs, whether it be the more cutting edge modern chefs like、uh, Vicky in Hong Kong, both Vickys in Hong Kong, or even if you go into Japan, you talk about、um, you know the British born English guy,、um, what's his name,、um, Daniel Calvert, who uses a lot of Chinese technique in his cooking. You know, I think it's、um, the world is changing so much,、um, and it, it, it's fascinating to see. Our multiple generations are are working with each other in order to try to make the best possible food using、uh, multiple techniques. How do you share knowledge between chefs? You have to be open. I think you know. I think it, not everyone is very open, but there is a large community of of chefs, Chinese chefs in the community who are very open. I mean, I mean, today I had a chef in America asking me. Um, about、uh, choy pege, and you just write down the recipe. You tell him, you know, the、um, the mortos mixture, the seasoning mixture, the、um, glass flour mixture, and then you just hope you give it to them. You see what they do with it, and afterwards they bring you back, brings it back, and they show you what they've done with it, and you're going to learn something. And then it's from that you evolve. You evolve a bit more. And the end product is always just to make delicious food. So they reach out to you because they know you, or because recommend by someone or from internet. Oh, everything now in open world, and anyone can send me a message on Instagram now, you know, and say hi, you know. But I mean, this particular person is a good friend of mine. So he used to work in a, a French restaurant. Now he's in San Francisco, and he's fascinated by Chinese techniques. So if there's anything I can help with, I'm more than happy to help. So, as a Chinese chef, do you eat or cook in a particular manner? Particular what? Manner. Manner. You mean my style? I, I, you know, I think that our style in in A Wong is is very unique. I think I think there's not many restaurant. I don't think there's any restaurant in the world that cooks the way that we cook. You know, that might mean that you like what we do or you hate what we do. Um, but either way, if you like it or hate it, we still have a very unique way of cooking. I think that our style is very much about kind of exploring Chinese food through culture. I think that a lot of it is very kind of、um, heavily thought out in regards to texture, in regards to temperature,、um, and then on top of that, I like to think that a lot of the way that we the serve food that we serve is also very playful. So. How do you bring your research to your design of your recipe?、Um, I, I I don't like to think of it too much in terms of oh we research something, then we create a dish, then we research something else and we create a dish. I like to think of it in terms of the research that we do is always at the back. So everything that we do, it makes just our thought process or things that we can bring to a dish. More interesting later on down the line. It's not about okay, here is a dish from the Qing Dynasty, and then we're going to put it on the menu as this. Here's a dish from the Song Dynasty, and we're going to make this. It's not really about. I think people who do that, I think they miss out so much on on making really interesting, delicious,、uh, delicious dishes. I think really it should always be an influence in the background.、Um, I can tell you recently we're working on a dish. Uh, which is based on、um, a very very classical Cantonese dish using、uh, sliced chicken with sliced whelks and、uh, gamma photo. I'm taking that as a base, and also the fact that one of my favourite dim sum items is、um, a dong feng lao, and then together we put the two together in trying to make a more interesting dish of kind of a curry chicken with whelk dish. 
with a few kind of smoked ham influences within the dish. But yeah, it, it's very much about trying to use that as an influence for creativity. So, um, if you can think of one object, for example, like you walk chopstick or whatever in the kitchen, okay. So which one you can you can represent Chinese chef to the UK, in the UK. The walk. An object in your kitchen. The most representing Chinese cuisine. Chinese cuisine. The walk. Walk. Yeah. Okay. The walk. The dim sum basket. One of those two. One. The walk probably. Okay. Yeah. So about the walk, which walk, which type of walk you use? You know the the handle one or the with the ear one. Oh, we use a handle one. Yeah, only because the the what the ear one is normally more for a big burner, like a big hotel. So the ones where you have to cook um, fifty portions in one go, whereas our restaurant is really designed to cook tiny portions. So there's no need to have such a a big wok. So why you think this the wok we can represent Chinese chef? Because the wok um, it. It exemplifies every technique that we need to do. So when we steam, we use a wok. When we stir fry, we use a wok. When we deep fry at multiple temperatures, we use a wok. When we smoke things, we use a wok. You know, when we make soup, we use a wok. We do. We use the wok for everything. So I think that really encapsulates what Chinese gastronomy is really about. It's not about having loads of equipment. It's not about um, complica- overly complicating things for the sake of complicating them. We use, a, we find a staple piece of equipment and we find a thousand different ways to utilize that piece of equipment. And I think fundamentally that really is the core of so many of the very, very best Chinese dishes that I've ever learned over time. So, any structure that you can think of that you have been through from the past? 20 years or 12 years? Struggle? Of course, running a restaurant is a struggle. Every day is a struggle. Um, yeah, Chinese, whether or not you're struggling with the guest and getting them to understand what you're doing or misunderstanding what you're doing or getting to under, get the, the staff to understand the requirement that you want and the fact that you want to do something different to everyday problems that we've got, maybe be COVID, the demonstrations, the economy, the weather, there's multiple. Every day there's always some challenge. Um, but it comes back to really growing up in that environment and watching my parents. Um, I, I used to use the word hustle, but it, it really is. To finding any means possible in order to fix problems. You, know, you have to do whatever you need to do in order to find a solution. Can you tell me your biggest challenge? When? Covid time or whatever when you want to restaurant for a long time? I, you know, I think the, the biggest challenge we've had over the entire 11 years is really trying to find a way to get our guests to understand what we do and get them to be on board with um, our particular style of Chinese food and what we stand for as a restaurant. And, and obviously that changes all the time. So making sure that our guests are still understanding that is probably the ongoing most difficult challenge. So you mentioned quite a lot of time about the understanding. Mm. So actually how you can help your customer to understand? In what way? Can you give me some example? Sure. I think a lot of it is about introducing them to um, technique, ingredients, flavours that they might not necessarily eat right so I, for example um, eating sea cucumber for example you know it's a culturally a very important ingredient for us in in Hong Kong but try and pick to get a, a western palate to appreciate the texture and the flavors that we use for um, sea cucumber it can be quite challenging sometimes so it's about finding ways um, to do that whether or not um, slightly modifying the way we present it or the way that we put it together in a dish it, a lot of this is basically all trying to find ways to engage the guest into understanding the ingredient and therefore being more open to trying it and then once they become a little bit familiar with it 
to eventually go to China, go to Hong Kong, and try the dishes where it literally is a whole sea cucumber braised inside a sauce and eating it like that. But that takes, it takes baby steps. And so our job primarily as a, as a restaurant in an international city like London is to introduce our guests to those things so that when they go and have it in its, in its more, most traditional form, that it no longer becomes so scary. So like London, an international city, so what is your view on authentic Chinese food? Yeah, I, I, I think people always get overly um, hung up on this idea of authentic food. And the, the, the thing I always like to tell people is, if you look at um, Sichuanese food, and you talk about kind of uh, mala, what do the ingredients that you, you think of when you think about that as a staple of Sichuanese food? It's obviously citron peppercorn and it's chili. But obviously chilies have got nothing to do with China. Chilies arrived in China in the 16th century from South America. So if you're talking about authenticity, you know, it, the, those people who, who are always hanging on to this idea of authenticity, that it's somehow it's grown out of China. Well, no, actually, every time you see a chili, chilies were, are not originating from China. And so much of Chinese gastronomy is that. You would be aware or not you talk about a lot of the amazing vegetarian food that we have. A lot of that vegetarian food comes out of Buddhism. Buddhism originated and came to China in 1 AD from India. So if you start talking about that, then actually, fat til turn, all these amazing dishes, you say, all right, well, it comes from Buddhism, and Buddhism didn't come from China, therefore it can't be authentic as well. So I think a lot of people, when they say these things, I think a lot of it is just for them to try to make sense for themselves of what they think Chinese food is. But they don't really account for the bigger picture. Um, and I, to me, authenticity isn't about that. Authenticity is a moving, fluid understanding. Um, authenticity isn't just a line in the sand and everything above it is inauthentic and everything below it is authentic. It's constantly changing and moving and morphing and evolving. And people need to understand that. So what do you think about Chinese food in China now? I think Chinese food in China is changing so quickly. I think if anything, it's changing more quickly than the Chinese food in, in the Western world. I mean, some of the, the young chefs now in China, they're doing the most amazing things. And some of it is in embracing the past, so embracing very, very old historic Chinese technique. But at the same time, they're embracing Western technology, they're embracing Western ingredients, they're embracing Western technique in creating this new Chinese gastronomy. Um, and actually a lot of the people who, who moan about um, chefs trying new things in Chinese restaurants, a lot of them don't account for the fact that a lot of the chefs in, in China at the moment are incredibly um, forward thinking and changing the way that they cook Chinese food. Okay. Hold so, on one second. Hey Mark. Hello. Hello? Yeah, that's all right. You're all done? Brilliant. Can I lock up? Right now? All right, brilliant. I'm just in the middle of something. I, I, I won't be able to pop out for, for a bit. I'll try, try just wire it to you. Yeah. No, I'll wire it to you. Yeah. I've got your details, yeah. Nice one. I'll lock the door now. Do I just send me the new ones? Yeah. Nice one. Thank you. Bye bye. Sorry. Okay. Interview resumed. So uh, you mentioned about the uh, Chinese food in China. So to what extent this Chinese food at the moment will influence your identity or your practice? 
I think it's a it's this idea of, of looking at these chefs from not only my generation but from older generations who are now thinking about Chinese foods and looking at different ways to evolve it and to celebrate those old dishes and those old flavors but in new ways and when I look at people do that it excites me because it really it, it makes you feel less hesitant and nervous about trying new things and to me it's, it's just a wonderful time at the moment where so many different chefs um, within Chinese restaurants are trying different things and being very brave with what they do. So what was your favorite food when you were young? My favorite food? Uh, my favorite food was probably my grandmother's food. My grandmother was from um, Sichuan and her home cooking was amazing. Um, but e even, even simple things, you know, yeah, simple things. Her instant noodles were amazing. Um, I don't know why. I think she used to add vinegar to it or something. Um, and then she used to make incredible uh, marinated cucumbers. She used to do, make delicious soups, um, chicken broths. She used to make a very, very delicious uh, yu hong keji um, together with vegetables. And yeah, it's, um, that was my earliest food memory of, of really delicious food. So it actually was cooked by your grandmother. It's not a particular dish. It's actually cooked by my grandmother. Yeah, yeah. But I think, you know, it's with, with, with cooking, it is the individual more than anything. Because, I, I, as I always said, I could give a recipe to 20 different people and they would, the end product would be different 20 different times. So it is very much about the person more so than the recipe. And my grandmother just had a very good way of, incredible way of cooking food. Um, and she had a very fantastic palate in order to create delicious food. So can I say your grandmother is actually the soul of the food culture in your family? Um, I think she's pretty much one of the only people who, who I would say um, I ate their food and it influenced mine. You know, actually my father was not really a very, uh, um, not really a cook cook. My mother was very business minded. My grandfather wasn't really um, a, cook, a cook cook. He, he grew up in the army, you know. Food is just to survive. He used to tell us, like, I don't know what you're worrying about, you know. You're lucky to even have some food. Um, my grandmother was the only one where, who would make an effort every dinner time, nine or ten dishes, spend hours in the kitchen, um, whatever it is, go to the farm, get the chicken, kill them in the garden, you know, go into the supermarket from Nuneaton to Birmingham just to buy these the ingredients to uh, buy gai lan and buy choy sam and buy for you and all this stuff. Um, so, yeah, she was really one of the only people in my family that I look at and go, wow. Um, I remember distinctly eating their food growing up. So what was your grandmother's signature dish? My grandmother, as most grandmothers, their signature dish is always the one that they, that you tell them that it's nice one time and then for the next 20 years they cook that dish every time you go see them. So if my sister used to tell my grandmother that she used to like aubergine, so she used to always get you hunkeji every time we'd go there. Um, I was always a massive fan of instant noodles, um, so she used to always uh, make a special effort to make sure my chuching yad thing was the best. Um, uh, her, her cucumber was amazing. Um, what have we She used to make a lot of um, stuffed tofu as well. Like she stuffed pork. Uh, young dal for really delicious that steamed fish again um, and then the soups I mean, the soups used to be quite frightening because she used to get the chicken from the farm kill it in the garden and then make these soups with these chicken but obviously the chicken because it's, it, it, it's organic from the farm it had like semi embryos floating the head would be floating and she would eat the head and everything and we would drink the soup so it, it was very unique from that perspective. So uh, this food is actually linked with your childhood memory? Yes, I think so. I think th that was probably one of the only times growing up where we used to sit down as a family to eat. So number one, it was amazing food. But more importantly, it was the idea that every time we ate my grandmother's food, it was also one of the only times we were sitting together as a family to eat food. Because my parents had restaurants, so I was either locked in the office doing homework, 
or I was at home from 11, maybe younger. I think when my sister was 11 and I was eight, my sister was cooking for me after school because my parents were in a restaurant and she was putting pizzas or, or making noodles for us at home. So the idea of eating a proper family meal is actually a very, very unusual concept to me um, growing up. How old were you at that time? Um, so I imagine I was, um, I was, hello. Andrew. Hey, you are. Right? Lovely to see you. I'm back. You well? Back from Norfolk. Wow, incredible. We came back about yeah, I know. three months ago. And now you're, 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 you're an education institute, your old place. <laughs> it is, yeah. I came in to see if we can get a table sometime. Of course you can. Yeah, yeah, go. But John, John's right here. Don't be silly. John will help you. What am I doing? John. Nice to see you. How hey. is Nazali? Very well. Christy. Give him my love. Will do. So, interview was soon. Uh, how old were you at the time for your family meal? Sit together. Oh, so family was sitting together at my grandmother's house yeah. growing up. So, from five, six onwards. But that was like, you know, only holidays or Christmas or Chinese New Year or from, from reason to go and see my grandparents. So any fun memory during the family meal together? Fun? Yeah, a fun memory. Of course, I mean, sitting down eating delicious food is always a fun memory. I think on top of that, when you have uh, family along with distant family, so some of my family lived in Holland, uh, some of my family lived in different parts of the, the world, are coming together, you know, it's the, first, it's the only time that all the grandchildren got together, it's the only time that all your aunties and uncles came together, um, so yeah, it was it was more about this idea of being together. So have you travelled back to your hometown to find out more about the uh, hometown cuisine? Which I've done. Hong Kong. Oh, okay. Well, it's hard because my my grandfather was a refugee from um, his original origin is Mong San in Guangzhou. Don't tango. More than tango. I don't even know where it is, but. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I haven't been back. I should go back. Um, my grandmother's side from Sichuan, again, I never went back. My sister went back recently. Um, so really, it's been more about spending time with the family who are still alive in Hong Kong in, and, and spending time with them in Hong Kong as opposed to going back to the places of origin because a lot of them have moved out from those places now and they've either living in US or the UK, or if they do still live in China, it's in Hong Kong. So where do you get the inspiration for your cooking? You know, I think the inspiration for the cooking comes from many, many different um, sources. But I think nowadays, in 2024, as we've been open now for uh, 12 years, it's really more and more about searching for deliciousness through Chinese technique, more than anything. They don't have to be dishes, which I've seen before in Hong Kong, but they do have to be a celebration of a technique in the Chinese repertoire. So what would be your vision for yourself or for the Chinese chef community in the UK? The vision, you know, I think, I think at the moment in the UK, I think we're going through uh, See you soon, you managed to get a table? Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you. Bye. Um, I think we're going through uh, a really interesting time in, in the UK with our Chinese restaurants. I feel like a lot of the family-run restaurants, which um, were previously open, whether it be the takeaways, family-run businesses, I think they're becoming less and less. Um, and I feel like the way the economy is going at the moment, you know, restaurants like ours or family-run larger-scale restaurants are becoming less and less. And so what you were, we're seeing, what I'm seeing, is a lot more Chinese restaurants being um, backed by large non-Chinese corporations a lot of the time. 
and it's basically uh, becoming an interpretation of Chinese food and the Chinese restaurant, which is also very interesting, but it's just very different. So what are the things you hope to modify about the Chinese food? I don't, hope to, I, don't, I don't hope to modify anything about Chinese food. I think that you know, the food that we cook is our type of food. I don't, I don't feel like it's, it's better. Um, I don't think Chinese food needs modifying. I think it's about finding the right time to celebrate the right technique. What will you pass to your next generation about your life and skill of being a Chinese chef in the UK? Um, hmm, good question. You know what, I think, I, I don't try to think about it too much. I, I, I think the fact that you know, we try to do what we do and we try to be the best that we could be and you hope that that in itself is enough of an inspiration for the next generation. Okay, now in uh, 20 and 24, name your favourite dish. This year, because I know you've got quite a lot of favorite dish, favorite Chinese food. Yeah, many. Yeah. My favorite Chinese dish. I tell you, one of the most interesting dishes I had recently was uh, bo lei ha, but the um, the the chef who cooked it in Hong Kong, he turned the long ha into the most beautiful osmanthus shape, and. Um, he wouldn't tell me the technique, but uh, it would have required a lot, a lot of skill in cutting, in marinating, and in the cooking process in order to achieve the end result because the, the, the lobster ended up looking exactly like a opened out flower and it had a lovely texture to it um, and it was with a delicious kind of um, uh, chicken based uh, sauce. Are there any story or memories that you would like to share with us before we end the interview? Any what, sorry? Any story, fun memory about, you know, how food can pull out your childhood memory? I think everyone should be fully aware of the fact that food is such an important part of one's childhood and the memories that they have. I don't know any culture in the world where food doesn't also um, relate to being together or a family unit or a special occasion and I think with that I'm pretty sure that most people in the world will normally have fond really significant childhood memories related to food. What is your comfort food? My comfort food? Instant noodles. So actually it was your grandmother one of the signature dish? Sure. But you know, to me, I'm, I'm a massive noodle fan. Um, I Is love noodle or noodle? all noodles. It doesn't matter if it's lai mean or it's a e mean or it's a honde mean or it's a anything. Any noodle, I I I, I love, um, and it really is my go-to all the time. And I think I, even my children look at me now and they think they see it. So my son still tells people that his favorite food is noodles. I don't know if that's actually true or not, but I think he sees me eating noodles all the time, and now he's becoming to 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 to, to tell people that noodles are also his favourite food. Why instant noodle? It's not instant noodle. It's that brand of instant noodle. It's chuchin. That thing is very very unique because I eat a lot of. I've tried all instant noodles, whether it be from Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, anywhere. It's that particular brand, and it's the sesame flavour. Um, which is so significant to me. Um, but the noodles in itself, they're still firm, they don't go all soft, but you have to cook them just enough. And then the soup base is um, very pleasant. It's not aggressive, it's not too spicy, and you can just eat it very easily with just some vegetables or anything that you've got left in the fridge, you just throw it in and it's always delicious. So once again, I'm really much appreciate that you have accepted our interview and share your story with us. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And yeah, thank you. Thank you.